Good afternoon and welcome to today's event. My name is Sri Raj Patel, Chair of the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce and Vice President of Commercial Financial Services at RBC. On behalf of the Winnipeg Chamber of Commerce, I acknowledge we're gathered today on Treaty 1 territory, the traditional land of the Ojibwe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene Nations, and the homeland of the Red River Métis. This past year, the federal government passed legislation to create a new statutory holiday on September 30th, known as National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. This holiday provides an opportunity to recognize and commemorate the tragic history and ongoing legacy of residential schools and to honor their survivors, their families, and communities. Which is why, although not regulated to do so, the Chamber has decided to close our offices on September 30th and dedicate that day for our staff to take reconciliation training and education. In the spirit of reconciliation, we encourage our members and our community to do the same. To learn more, please check out the Chamber's Truth and Reconciliation Roadmap on our website at winnipeg-chamber.com TRR. Welcome to the kickoff of the 2021-2022 Membership Luncheon Series. For this series, we come together each month to connect and hear from leading business experts from across the world to address important issues facing your business. While we may not be together physically today, we are thrilled to resume our in-person chamber luncheons and events next month. As our members, we know you rank networking and being with your community as your top priority. And our top priority is the health and safety of our staff, volunteers, and members. In order for us to gather safely, we recently announced our in-person protocols for the upcoming season, which includes mandatory proof of COVID-19 vaccination, mask use, and more. For more information, we encourage you to read our FAQ on preparing for your next Chamber event on our blog at winnipeg-chamber.com. We thank all our members for being patient with us as we continue to navigate through this pandemic, which brings us to the reason we're here today. As business owners, how do you begin to plan for the future? What issues are you facing that you didn't expect? How can you continue to move forward when the future is unknown? Look, we know there is no playbook for how the next year, months, or even days will look, but we all know the importance of planning and preparing for the unknown. But how can we as business owners plan for the next disruption? Today, we have the honor and privilege to speak to Frank Sapovitz, President and Chief Experience Officer at Fast Traffic Events and Entertainment. For more than 30 years, Frank has been at the helm of some of the world's most prestigious, widely viewed, and well-attended sports and entertainment events. We all know the event industry came to a disruptive halt at the beginning of the pandemic and how we gather will never be the same. As we move forward, what we do in person, events look like, and how do we properly plan for the next disruption? Today, Frank will share his take on the future of events and how businesses can prepare and be ready for the next disaster. But before I introduce Frank, I want to thank our event partners who have made today possible. I also want to thank to our chamber champions and chamber leaders who have stepped up and helped the chamber in providing events and support to our members. Thank you for everything you do. We encourage you to get on social media to join in on the conversation using the hashtag WCCBiz. Okay, let us get started. I'm extremely excited to be introducing you to our keynote speaker today. Remember the Super Bowl in 2013? I'll remind you. It was the Baltimore Ravens versus the San Francisco 49ers. 73,000 fans in the Superdome and millions of viewers watching all over the world. With 28 minutes and 22 seconds left in the game, out of nowhere, darkness. The Super Bowl suddenly lost all lights and power. Well, Frank, the man in charge of the entire Super Bowl operations during that moment of history is here with us today. Frank Sapovitz, served a combined 23 years as the Senior Vice President of Events for the National Football League and the Group Vice President of Events and Entertainment for the National Hockey League. In 2014, Frank founded Fast Traffic, an event management production and consulting firm that has served a wide range of sports and entertainment clients, including the Indy 500, Major League Baseball, Major League Soccer, among others. Frank is the host of When Things Go Wrong podcast and author of What to Do When Things Go Wrong and the Sports Event Management and Marketing Playbook. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Frank Sapovitz. 
First off, Maybe it's great to be back in Winnipeg, even if it's only virtually. <laughs> Looking forward to my next opportunity to get there in person. Well, we thank you so much for joining us. But first off, how are you doing today? Doing great. Um, looking forward to the beginning of a new football season, a new hockey season, new basketball season. Looking forward to the wrap up of Major League Baseball. Uh, I'm a New York Mets fan, so I'm still hopeful that they'll get in on the on the wild card. But anybody who's listening who's a Mets fan knows that you know they they tend to disappoint late in the season. So <laughs> you know, looking forward to you know for sports to be back. Looking forward for full arenas or at least arenas with people in them as opposed to what we experienced last year. For sure, definitely. Well, thank you. Your latest book and your podcast are all about better planning to avoid a crisis or managing them when they happen anyway. Given your career in sports and entertainment, what experience do you have in crisis management? Well, you know, events are en enormously detailed projects. At the end of the day, that's what they are. And when it comes to a Super Bowl that moves from place to place or an all-star game, all-star weekend that moves from place to place, it's very much like setting up a business and, and then doing whatever business you're doing that event and then tearing that business back down again and starting all over in another place a year later. So when you have an, a, a program or a project that has as many details as an event does, and you can imagine the Super Bowl probably has millions of details. Even if 99% of everything you've planned goes perfectly, there's dozens or even hundreds of things that are going to go wrong anyway, uh, even if it's just 1% of the total. Um, and that's why, uh, you know, I, in, in pretty much every event I've ever worked on, something goes wrong somewhere. Um, if you're lucky, it's a, it's a part of the uh, of the event that nobody notices the 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 detail of what went wrong sometimes a small number of people find out about it when it comes to blackouts at the super bowl 73,000 people and millions on television as you mentioned 100 115 million in the united states alone uh, they all found out about it at the same time it's not a secret <laughs> what i found was that although problems don't follow patterns solutions to problems often do. And that's pretty much what we're gonna be talking about today. Thank you. All right then, what's the first thing that you've learned about when things going wrong and how did you handle it? Well, I'm gonna take you back to the 1993 NHL All-Star Game in Montreal. It was the 75th anniversary of the National Hockey League and it was the 100th anniversary of the Stanley Cup. And one of the things that I thought would be really cool to do uh, was to celebrate the, the centennial of the Stanley Cup uh, in the city that had the most Stanley Cup wins, 24 of them, by bringing the Stanley Cup out at the beginning of the game, just as the broadcast started, held up high by three great Montreal Canadiens whose names were engraved on the trophy um, over and over again, which were Jean Beliveau, Maurice the Rocket Richard and uh, Guy Lafleur. And uh, uh, given that that was going to be at the beginning of the day, I had uh, informed my boss who had the Stanley Cup booked for a brunch with the sponsors that I really needed it by a specific time uh, to make sure that it was going to be there for its uh, entrance uh, at the beginning of the game or pregame and uh, on CBC, SRC, and, and then uh, back in the United States as well. I believe it was on NBC. And uh, so we're about, it, it's about minus 25, not an atypical Montreal, uh, you know, February morning. It was, uh, it was sleeting and uh, actually uh, snowing and sleeting. The streets had been covered with ice and, uh, you know, I thought nothing of it because here I am, I'm at, this, I'm at the arena, I've been there for hours, I'm not thinking about the weather outside. And, uh, you know, about five minutes before we go to air, I get, I get a call from the stage manager who's waiting in the Zamboni entrance. Uh, I've got Maurice Richard here, I've got Jean Beliveau, I've got Guy Lafleur, I don't have a Stanley Cup. And, uh, of course, I was pretty nervous when I had heard that. Uh, I was 
I, I was trying to figure out what we were going to do. Um, three minutes before, two minutes before, still no Stanley Cup, nobody knows where it is. I kind of knew where it must have been. You know, it must have left the hotel late. Um, and, and just before I'm about to cancel the whole thing, uh, I get a call that the Stanley Cup has made it into the building uh, just in time. Like literally the keeper of the cup, the same keeper of the cup, by the way, that's the keeper of the cup today, Phil Pritchard, is rolling it through the, the uh, bowels of, of, uh, of the Montreal Forum back then. And he gets it to the, to the Zamboni garage. The stage manager opens it up. Let's go bring the Stanley Cup out onto the ice. Uh, they put it in Maurice Richard's hands and he steps out onto the ice. And I remember, I remember that moment really distinctly because it's, it's, it's the kind of moment at the hundredth anniversary of the Stanley Cup that, that is unforgettable. And it was particularly unforgettable because Maurice Richard dropped the Stanley Cup as he walked out onto the ice. And I remember this, instead of starting the event off with a bang, there was a, rear, there was a physical bang as this hit the, as it hit the ice and as it dented uh, on national television, both in, in English uh, slash French Canada and, and in uh, the United States. And, uh, you know, as I'm trying to regain my composure, uh, I noticed that SRC is running it again in slow motion, you know, with a close up on Maurice Richard's face with this look of horror. And of course, I'm thinking that my my NHL career is is just about as over <laughs> as the Stanley Cup's perfect condition at that particular point. Uh, you know, what I learned back then was that hope is not a strategy. That's a real truth as you plan anything. Uh, I had hoped that the Stanley Cup was going to be there on time. It wasn't. Here's why Maurice Richard dropped the Stanley Cup. It did leave the, the brunch on time as it, would, as it was supposed to. There was an enormous traffic jam because of the glazed streets and the, and the snow and, and deep cold. And Phil, uh, rightly, sitting in the cab, knew he wasn't going to get to the arena in time. So he jumped out of the cab, brought the, the, the road box, the wheeled road box that the Stanley Cup is sitting in, and pushed it down the street for blocks. So by the time it got to the Montreal Forum, this st sterling silver heirloom was also chilled to minus 25. So it, it got into the Maurice, Maurice Richard's hands. It was way too cold for him to handle, and he dropped it. He had to drop it. He didn't have any choice. Uh, so the fact of the matter was that I didn't have a good plan A. I didn't have a plan B of what would happen if the Stanley Cup wasn't there. What I probably should have done was make sure that the Stanley Cup left the hotel well before uh, the, my boss was, was ready to let it go. But if I couldn't do that, I probably shouldn't do this at the beginning of the game. I couldn't imagine that anybody would would have been faced with the question of whether uh, the weather being so bad that that it would be stuck in a traffic jam, which, by the way, ended up happening again many years later when the Stanley Cup was supposed to be delivered uh, at the end of the Stanley Cup finals. I don't recollect the team, but it but it actually did happen again. Um, in this particular case, you know, it went from bad to worse, which was we didn't have a Stanley Cup and then we did, but then we damaged it beyond all recognition, which was awful. Um, I had hoped the Stanley Cup was going to be there on time. Hope is not a strategy. Sure. And, and what I probably should have done was not even have a plan B. I should have had a different plan A, right? My plan A probably would have said, you know, this is really risky. I don't have a lot of time to do this. If I was smart, I would have done it during the, the period break between the first and second period or the second period and the third period. You know, that, that was the first thing that I learned is, is relying on hope and that everything's gonna go the way you plan is not the way that you create a risk management plan. 
Wow, amazing story and, and amazing insights from the lessons from that story. So thank you so much. I mentioned earlier you were in charge of the Super Bowl the year the power failed at the Superdome. Describe what happened and what was happening behind the scenes while the lights were out. Well, this is a this is a, a another mega truth, if you will. And you may not have broken it, but you still have to fix it, right? I knew nothing about what it takes to power a building. That's not my job. I'm not an electrician. I'm not an engineer. I don't really understand how to do that. Um, what happened was um, the power actually failed in about half the building. And it was very, very clear that it was likely going to fail in the other half of the building if we didn't take immediate action. Now, one of the one of the things that you're going to encounter when you have a crisis hit you either whether it's a, an event or project or a piece of business that goes south on you or your business itself goes south is there's this sinking feeling in your guts right you there's a rush of adrenaline there's nothing you can do about it that's a physical thing it's just going to happen but you have to resist the urge to act too quickly you have to take a beat and work the problem. And that's not something that I invented. Not hope is not a strategy. It's not something I invented. It's just something that I say. This is something that, that Gene Krantz said during the Apollo 13 uh, disaster after the explosion. He said to his staff, hold on, take a beat, work the problem. What we had to determine at that point and what we, what we started to do was think about what the first thing was that we had to do in response. And it's not getting the plug back in the wall to repower the building. The thing that was the, was the most important thing for us to do at that particular time was to tell the public in the building what to do. Communication was really key because you've got 73,000 people there. If if it's an unsafe environment, you have to ask them to leave. You don't want to endanger anybody's safety. Safety is a non-negotiable. If it's a safe environment, you don't want them to leave. You want them to stay so that you can get the game going again. So the first thing we had to determine was, do we have a safe environment or an unsafe environment? It had nothing to do with the electricity at that particular point. It had to do with why the electricity went out. Was there a fire somewhere that would require us to evacuate the building? Was there a terror attack going on? That's something that unfortunately we have to think about today. Right. Was it a cyber terror situation, a ransomware attack perhaps, who knows? But our law enforcement representatives up at NFL Control, which is where I was, the control booth, and, and uh, our public safety personnel, our medical personnel, our electric, uh, our electrical engineers that that worked for the building, were looking at the source of the problem, and then determined within a couple of minutes that it was a safe environment. There was it was just a quit an equipment failure that had to be repaired or could be repaired. There were steps that needed to be taken to to do that. But in the meantime, my biggest concern was to make sure we didn't have panic. Because remember, nowadays, you have social media that's telling the story. They're telling the story whether I'm telling the story or not. And it may not be the right story. So I have to be authentic, I have to be accurate, and I have to be reasonably quick to be able to tell people to stay in their seats. And that's exactly what we did. How did we do that in a building that had no power? What's one of the wonderful things about major places of public assembly in North America is that most public address systems are have a battery backup. So, and it's done for that reason. If there's a power failure, you have about 30 minutes worth of talk time, if you will. And we were able to write a quick script for the public address announcer. Unfortunately, he wasn't in the same place we were. We didn't have a way of radioing him because our transmitters were down. We didn't have a way of phoning him because our phones were down. We had somebody run down a darkened hallway, down darkened steps, uh, down to him, and he was able to deliver the message for everybody to stay in place. Wow, amazing. I love those two elements of working the problem and staying authentic. Uh, thank you. 
How did the team at NFL Control stay calm with 110 million Americans watching on television? But remember, I talked about the adrenaline rush. You get it. Um, it's it's unavoidable. Everybody's experiencing it. Certainly, uh, me as the as the leader in that particular location, uh, I was certainly feeling it. Was I anxious? <laughs> you bet I was. Was I panicked? Absolutely not. If if you're the leader, you have to not you have to not show any panic. You have to show cool confidence, calmness. One of two things happens um, because another mega truth is panic paralyzes decision making. It absolutely does. It paralyzes you in making rational decisions because your fight or flight response, your biological response is taking over it automatically. Um, and what happens is if you panic, everybody watching you either starts to panic too or they start to ignore you because you've lost control and you can't allow either of those things to happen. The reason that we were able to maintain some amount of calm is because about 10 days before every Super Bowl that I managed, we conducted a tabletop exercise, a game day simulation of everyone who was at NFL control in a position to make decisions on game day. We would, we would do a simulation. We would bring in a facilitator who we made familiar with our operating plan, with the facility, and he would throw disasters at us for about four hours. And we would have to solve them in real time as a team. And remember, because the Super Bowl moves from place to place, uh, and I mentioned you know, it's like building a company and then tearing it back down again, a lot of the people in the room are from the local market. So local law enforcement people, local stadium people, people we don't work with every day. So you really, this simulation also defines the decision-making command, you know, command and control, uh, you know, organizational structure. And it starts to give people confidence that you know what this, per that this person knows what they're doing. So we went through those kinds of exercises all the time. And it, it was everything from a toxic waste spill to a fire in the parking facility where the staff would be parking to uh, a, a structural failure in the building. Not one of them was a power failure. But that didn't matter. Because how you respond, not what you do necessarily, but how you respond becomes a little bit more codified, becomes a little bit more institutionalized when you do those things. And you're able to handle other kinds of problems or pretty much any kind of problem. It's not preparing for everything that could happen. It's preparing for anything that could happen. And that, that, was, the key, uh, that was the key reason for doing it. When the lights went out, we went right into problem solving mode like we did 10 days before for that simulation. And you know, we were uncertain about what the outcome was going to be while we were working the problem. But that tabletop exercise, that ability to gather people together and make decisions together and delegate authority as you need to delegate authority and responsibilities. Once you got through that process, when a crisis did actually occur, we felt a lot more comfortable that we could tackle it. Excellent, well, thank you. So then leading is not always directing? No, it's not. And, and think about it. I, I could not have possibly directed every single response or evaluative process that we needed during the blackout. What I needed to do was decide what, what order to do things in. So if you've, if you've selected the right people, if you've hired the right people and you've set the expectations and you've told them what it is they're responsible to do or what they're authorized to do, if you've empowered them in that way, then get out of their way, <laughs> let them do their jobs. Uh, we wouldn't have recovered as fast as we did if everyone was waiting for me to give orders because in order to do that, I would have had to be informed of everything that they were doing 
and a lot of the intrinsic institutional knowledge that they have that I don't with respect to an electrical system in a building. I don't, I don't know about that stuff. So the response time suffers. And what happened was, and this is, this is really the remarkable part of the story that's really not well known. I mentioned half of the building had, had no power. There were two feeder cables that came into the building and there was one backup that could be tied into one of them if, if one of them failed. Well, one of them did fail. And the reason it failed was because it was set incorrectly. Uh, and it was a brand new piece of equipment, actually. It was a giant circuit breaker called a relay, electrical relay. And it shut down that power cable because the computer in that relay saw an immediate power surge after the halftime show. And the reason it did was because we shut off all the lights, we shut off all the power, the halftime show was on its own generators, and there was no power consumption in the building. When we turned everything back on again, the computer is seeing a power, you know, power consumption increasing dramatically over a very short period of time. It did exactly what it was designed to do, shut itself off. And had the building team not shut off the HVAC system in the building, the heat ventilation air conditioning system, if they had not shut off the refrigeration systems, if they had not shut down the escalators and half of the lighting in the part of the building that was still operating, within the investigation after the event showed that within 60 seconds, the rest of the building would have gone completely dark as well. Wow. So the fact that they were able to be empowered to solve their part of the problem without waiting for instructions from me really was the was the the reason that we were able to resume the game at all. Wow, amazing. Okay, effective leadership is essential when things are going wrong. Having a great team to lead is also important, and clearly the ability to respond quickly is key. But recovery requires more than speed, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it really requires that beat that I mentioned. So remember these words if you remember nothing else. A recovery requires a response, not a reaction. A reaction is something that you do involuntarily. Something happens and you react too quickly and sometimes you create unintended consequences down the line because you did act too quickly. So let me give you an example. It goes back to the blackout and why, why it was so important to respond rather than react. With 24, with 24 minutes into the blackout, we had all the lights back on. We had the building powered up again and the lights were at full of color temperature to, to be able to start the broadcast. And as you can imagine, with 110 million people watching on CBS, in the United States, we were under an enormous amount of pressure to tee up the ball and let them kick off right away, as soon as we possibly could. But we didn't do that. We didn't start the game for 34 minutes instead of the 24 minutes. What did we do during those 10 minutes? We realized, because we took the time to respond rather than react and bow to the pressure of, and it, and it was righteous pressure. I mean television spots are five million dollars for a 30 second spot you don't want people turning the game off because they think all has been lost right that you're not going to be able to get the game going again so the pressure was quite enormous uh, but what we did in those 10 minutes was we checked every information system we needed every piece of technology that we needed to make sure that they were functional so that we could get the game going again under the same conditions that we should have, which is, does the instant replay system work? Does the score clock work? Do the coach to quarterback communication systems work? We went through every single system and said, okay, we're not gonna get this game started again until we've checked absolutely everything that we know that everything is back up and running. So what would have happened if we teed up the ball at 24 minutes instead of 34 and kicked off the ball, there was another score, there was a controversial play and the officials go under the hood to take a look at the instant replay and there is no instant replay. What's the story now? The story's not about the blackout. 
The story is exactly what I just said. Who is the moron that started this game again without checking to make sure that was working? So, and I would have been that moron. So we, we did take a look at every system. And in fact, one of the coach to quarterback systems didn't work. So we were able to repair it in that 10 minutes and, and then get the game going again in, in, the 20, in the 34. So we didn't want the unintended consequence of having a controversial finish to the game because one of those systems didn't work. Well, in the past, you've mentioned that most people would not have anticipated a global pandemic of the nature of the one we're experiencing. But having said that, all the symptoms of the global pandemic and what has happened since then were totally predictable. They were totally predictable. Nobody could have predicted a pandemic, global pandemic, that's going for two years. Nobody. Um, I mean, yes, it happened 100 years ago or so. Um, it was definitely something that an infectious disease expert knew um, and would have anticipated. I don't think most of us would have. Um, you know, you don't, you don't plan your business around a once in a hundred year situation like that. But think about the symptoms of the COVID-19 pandemic. Almost all of them were predictable. Let me give you an example. Uh, most businesses experience during lockdowns or whatever a, a cash flow interruption. Well, that's happened before, right? It happens during times of economic stress. It happens when a business is under stress for whatever reason uh, that is not global uh, or not national. Um, so if you didn't have a, a plan for a cash flow interruption, you should have <laughs> because there are enough situations that that occur that that create a cash flow problem. Remember, I said it was that problems don't fo follow um, don't follow patterns, but solutions often do. Well, the solution to a cash flow problem is one of those. How about an in inability to get to your workplace? Well, that was a COVID nineteen symptom, but it's something that I I can certainly see. As, as something that could happen. Maybe it's because of a power failure in the city. Maybe it's because of, of architectural failure somewhere. So an inability to get to the workplace and being able to decentralize your operations to some degree, those are all foreseeable. Um, the third I'll mention is the disruption to, to the distribution chain. Right? Again, something that was a symptom of COVID-19, how many of us you know, were looking around for toilet paper and paper towels, right? Um, it, this could be happening on any level for any business who has a disruption to the distribution chain, either because of a tariff war or political problem or you know, a disaster at a particular um, uh, factory or plant that, that a business depends on. So, all of those kinds of things were, were predictable. And I think for the most part, businesses were prepared for that, or many of them were prepared for that because they do think about these things. Well, based on your experience working with companies, what are some of the most common mistakes organizations make in a crisis? And what are the steps we can take to avoid those mistakes? One of the, one of the biggest sources of damage after a crisis or during a crisis is a failure to communicate and, and a failure to be accurate or authentic in those communications. Um, one of the things that, that the commissioner of the National Football League said to me really early in my career at the NFL, which I've always taken, um, taken with me, and it, it didn't relate to this, but it does relate to this, uh, he didn't mean it, he wasn't saying it because of, of crisis management in particular, is when I, when I made a statement to him, his response was, is that what you know or is that what you believe? And that's a big difference, right? You can believe something with all your heart, doesn't make it fact. It may be fact, but you better have facts to back it up. You better be accurate in what you're saying and whatever your prognostication for your business happens to be. Um, so much damage is done by not 
communicating authentically with your customers, with your employees, with the marketplace. And like I said before, the conversation about what just happened is occurring on social media with you or without you. <laughs> you better jump in and try to at least be the source of authentic communication. If you, if you provide inaccurate information once, the public stops believing what you're saying. So you have to be accurate, even if your heart is in the right place. Is it what you believe or is it what you know for sure? Well, can you share some of the best practices that go above and beyond preparing for a crisis and the traditional business continuity plan? You know, I think simulating a, a, a a stressful time in your company is really important. We did it at the Super Bowl with that tabletop exercise. I've done it with clients uh, of fast traffic as well, where we simulate either a problem at the facility, an active shooter drill, you know, name, name it, but you know, regularly you should kind of war room a few things. You should definitely have a place for people to go, the decision makers for, you know, a place for them to go or a place for them to connect, to communicate if you can't go there in order to make decisions collaboratively, cooperatively, and in an informed sort of way. Um, you know, a, 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 a modification to the succession plan for me is what happens if you can't get to the boss? Um, the boss is not in, a, in an area where you can communicate with them. Maybe they're on an airplane to Switzerland, uh, not because they're escaping anything, but because they were going skiing on vacation, whatever it happens to be. You, you, need, you need kind of a, a secondary succession plan that's temporary. And, and those executives, those business people have to be empowered to be able to make decisions in real time you can't wait four hours or five hours or six hours for that plane to land. You just can't, there's, there's not enough time. The other thing that I would say that is really important is make sure that your contingency plans are actionable. It's so easy to write a contingency plan or an emergency plan, but you have to really step through it and pressure test it and try it out to make sure it actually works. Because otherwise, all you're doing is checking off the box. We need a contingency plan. We've got one. Here it is. It's a piece of paper. I've got it. Well, what if it's not actionable? What if it actually can't be put into effect or it doesn't work? And I found that out um, on another Super Bowl where we did have a problem. And the plans that we put into place were not actionable because I didn't have the people to be able to put it into action. I hadn't communicated what that plan was to everybody who would need to know what that plan would be. And, and in some cases, I didn't have the equipment that I needed to be able to do those things. And what this had to do with was, what if there was a structural failure or a techno technological failure at one of the gates to this stadium at the Super Bowl? Well, the plan was, well, we'll just move people around to the other gate. And that sounds great. It sounds like you know what to do. The problem is to get to that other gate, you had to walk about three quarters of a mile as a, as a fan. And there were no directional signs to show them how to get there. So if we said, well, go to the North gate instead of the South gate, they had no idea where the North gate was. They had no idea they were at the South gate. They had no way of knowing how to get there. And and as a consequence, we couldn't move anybody. People just waited until we were able to open the gates or accommodate them through that area. So it was a horrible experience for them and it backed up you know, the ability to get into the stadium by about an hour and a half. It was a terrible experience. So did we have it, a, a, a contingency plan? Sure we did. Was it something that I could actually put into effect? No, because we never actually stepped through it and, and ask the important questions. Is this something that is easy to put into effect? And the answer was it wasn't. Well, there's a lot more detail and more wisdom in your book, but in our limited amount of time, do you have any final thoughts on managing crises in our lives or businesses? 
Yeah, I, my, my parting shot is this. If it hasn't happened to you, it just hasn't happened to you yet. Uh, nobody gets through this their career or their lives or their businesses where everything went perfectly well. It's just a question of how many times it doesn't go well and how serious it is. Uh, it's really important to make sure that you take care of creating contingencies for the things that are existential to your business. So yes, you wanna make sure that you've got details covered, contingencies covered for distribution problems or for purchasing problems or for not being able to get into your building cash flow issues, all of those kinds of things. But it's, it's really, really important to deal with the things that are existential, the things that could seriously affect your, your business's ability to recover at all. Um, and think about how long, how long you've got to be able to solve those problems and put them into effect in order to save your business. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today, Frank, and for sharing your thoughts on, on leadership and on planning for the next disruption. It's my pleasure and um, go Jets. <laughs> Before we move into our breakout sessions, I want to invite you to our next in-person membership luncheon. Anyone a fan of TikTok here? I know my sons are. TikTok is one of the leading social media channels with 1 billion subscribers and over 689 million active users every month. During Small Business Week on Friday, October 22nd, Liz Bertarelli, social media lead at TikTok, will be sharing some of their secrets. In particular, Liz will share how your business can create social media content that highlights the human behind the brand. Res register today at winnipeg-chamber.com. Now, we have come to the part of the program where you'll have the opportunity to connect and hear from other members in the Winnipeg business community. This is your opportunity to participate in virtual networking roundtables, debrief what you learned, and share your thoughts with other local business and community leaders, all while connecting with a purpose and building meaningful relationships. Here's how this is going to work. On the left-hand side, you'll see a tab that says Sessions under the Stage tab. In each breakout room, the individual whose birthday is the closest to today's date will be the facilitator. If you are the facilitator, please encourage each attendee to do quick introductions. From there, there are three questions to guide each roundtable discussion. The three questions are, how do you plan for your business's worst case scenario? Is contingency planning a common practice for your business or organization? If so, what is your process? And the last one, what do you hope to take away from today's discussion? Okay, now it's time to network and discuss with other members in your community. Please click on the sessions button. Thank you again to Frank for joining us today. Once your breakout session is done, you do not need to go back to the stage the meeting will be adjourned. Have fun. <laughs>